So good evening guys. I hope all of you are doing fine. The exam went well. So yeah. So today uh, we'll be discussing some recall questions for the FMG December 2021 session. And I'm glad that uh, like more number of questions definitely came from the notes, AFMG notes, as well as the chanting sessions or the immediate sessions we had. Definitely there were some questions that were out of the box or out of the context. Uh, there are always such number of questions usually. This time, definitely as I got to know that PSM was uh, a bit different. That means it was com uh, not from the common topics, rather from some uncommon topics which are usually tend to ignore. But though uh, I'm happy that at least we would have we had covered them already in the classes, okay, during the sessions also. So yeah. So if uh, while I'm starting the session, just let me know. Definitely, this session is just a recall based session. Definitely, uh, like all the questions would not have the same language as you had them in the examination. And the second important thing being that not all the options would also resemble the examination ones. Though I have tried to come as close as possible to the exam ones with the help of all the students who were helping me in the recall. So with that, I could I would start the session. First of all, I would like to express my gratitude to each and every student who has helped to recall the questions from FMG December 2021 exam. Uh, all the aspirants. Okay. So all the aspirants, uh, all the FMG aspirants of the upcoming exam would definitely get a great help from this recall, and that is the reason why. I have asked you in the group also to help me in recalling these questions. So I would like to give a special mention to Dr. Sabi, Dr. Komal, Dr. Bhavna, Dr. Yash, Dr. Arman, Dr. Punit, Dr. Sushil, Dr. Sandeep, Dr. Sumant, Dr. Himanshu, Dr. Abhimanyu and Dr. Gautam. Uh, most of you guys have definitely helped me recall the questions directly or have sent me the questions on telegram group. So I'm glad that uh, like I was able to collect and compile these questions for you. Today we'll be discussing the first part which will comprise of 75 questions. It is a mixed one which will have uh, a bag of questions which will consist paper 1 as well as paper 2 questions, right? So I hope that each and everyone have, has given you a best shot. Now just let the results come out once everything will fall in place till that time. You can definitely watch the recall and uh, be confident enough that things will definitely fall in place, right? So the first question I feel this is a very easy one and all of you were able to mark it correct, right? So this was a question from anesthesiology and I'm pretty sure Dr. Dr. Vinayak uh, would have covered it. So identify the below given image and this image was given where you can see the oral cavity and the size of tongue was different. Right. So this is this one is what. So please remember here <coughs> when we assess the size of tongue with respect to the oral cavity, this is known as the option D Malampatti score. Right. So this was a Malampatti score, a commonly repeated question from anesthesiology in grade three and four. Usually the size of the tongue is really very large. And that is the reason why the intubation becomes difficult in grade three and four. And that is the reason why we actually assess Malampatti score in cases of anesthesiology. Second was ASA grading. This is anesthesiology, uh, American Society of Anesthesiologists grading, which is used to assess the physical status of a patient and also to check if the patient is fit or unfit for the surgery. Right? Adrate score usually as well as the PAR score. PAR score is a recovery score. Okay. Uh, usually seen, uh, usually used after a surgery and adrate score is a discharge scoring system after a surgery. Okay. All of these scores are used in anesthesiology. So I hope all of you have marked it right and please keep on answering in the chat box guys. Okay. Then and also let me know if some options were different or the uh, question was framed in some other manner. Okay. Please feel free to let me know that. Question number two was again from anesthesiology. Which of the following are intravenous anesthetic agents? So and a combination and this was the pattern which was commonly observed in this examination where actually uh, they have given a <coughs> what we can say two or three uh, drugs or maybe two or three uh, 
components of a triad in same options okay and that was just a mismatch so very good the intravenous anesthetic agents in this are option a that is propofol thiopentone and ketamine are all the intravenous anesthetic agents on the other hand the other options be option b halothane isoflurane and serofluorane these are usually inhalational anesthetic agents right these are usually inhalational anesthetic agents <coughs> next option c was chlorprocaine okay intravenous in pregnancy they asked no worries intravenous in pregnancy also would mean the same okay option c chlorprocaine prilocaine or lignocaine again this was also uh, usually these anesthetic agents are usually used as local anesthetics so please remember chlorprocaine prilocaine lignocaine usually these are either esters or amides which are used as local anesthetic agents right and the last two option was vecuronium rocuronium and mevacuronium uh, mevacurium all of you are quite aware now these are usually skeletal muscle relaxants right these are usually skeletal muscle relaxants mainly the non depolarizing skeletal muscle relaxants right so i hope it was pretty clear whether pregnancy was mentioned or otherwise the intravenous anesthetic agents would remain same propofol thiopentone ketamine okay important so this was also covered definitely next is question number 3 and question number 3 states a patient sustained a fracture of shaft of humerus and was unable to dorsiflex the wrist this is what is known as dorsiflexion right the below given splint was applied identify the splint so now they had given such kind of a image where the hand was actually or the wrist was actually dorsiflexed right so in this what was the provisional diagnosis definitely the provisional diagnosis would be wrist drop right the provisional diagnosis is wrist drop and wrist drop is due to which nerve injury so whenever the humerus shaft is fractured definitely the radial nerve which goes into the spiral or the humeral canal on the posterior aspect of the humerus or on the posterior shaft of the humerus definitely it is more at a risk of getting injured the same happened in this case also fracture shaft of humerus commonly leads to injury to the radial nerve which will manifest as wrist drop and for that purpose we use this kind of a splint which dorsiflexes which dorsi flexes the wrist and that is option d okay that was option d cock up splint right this usually i had covered in the last 100 118 images that we had covered okay the most re 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 repeated questions that had come okay knuckle bender splint this this one we usually discuss that it is used for ulnar nerve injuries in cases of claw hand or median plus ulnar nerve injuries in cases of complete claw hand right dennis brown splint was a question from last examination in june it is usually used for ctv that also we discussed and aeroplane splint it is used for brachial plexus injuries right i hope it was pretty clear now next was this question important and a repeated question again definitely covered by dr vikas in his sessions of smp so the question was question number 4 the below given snake is and the image was given and this image was of a common cobra i as far as i know so it was a common cobra naja naja right and uh, as discussed or as mentioned in the snaps also and uh, sir's lecture also definitely i hope you all have marked it correct yes very good it is option c it is a neurotoxic snake usually when the patient uh, would die by respiratory paralysis usually two types of snake belong to the elapidae family which is neurotoxic that is your common or king cobra and your crate right whereas hydropyridae hydropyridae would usually be the myotoxic snakes which will land up the patient in acute renal failure right and these are usually your sea snakes whereas the last one are hemotoxic snakes which are viperidae family russell viper soft scaled viper or pit viper all of these snakes belong to this family next question number 5 now identify the below given image now i hope uh, there was no history given because in the recall that i got they did not mention any history if there was like uh <clears throat> i would like to hear it from you so this is the image guys where there is actually a spasm of a group of muscles in a dead body or a corpse and he or she whoever it may be uh it is holding the body is holding some grass in his hands 
right? And the option over here would be option C, cadaveric spasm, right? So please remember cadaveric spasm as mentioned in the snaps itself, right? It is the most important and the commonly repeated question from drowning. So same question over here, great. So please remember it is a picture of cadaveric spasm guys please remember and it is a very important or the pathognomic feature of anti-mortem drowning when a patient is drowning before he dies okay when he is actually killed okay so in that cases usually he tries to save himself by uh, grasping all the grass or the soil and that is when we see this cadaveric spasm which is a feature of anti-mortem drowning rigor mortis is set in it is the stiffening of the muscles which sets in after the death right wash a woman's hands is this image usually due to immersion in water for a prolonged period of time of a dead body usually we find these kind of hands these are known as wash a woman's hands right next one question number six now and the question says identify the species of plasmodium from the below given peripheral blood smear and these two smears were given definitely uh, it was a bit confusing but not that much because all of you would have repeated it in classes definitely it was done in class but sir it was also covered in the snaps this was the image right so two rings uh, sorry two dots in a ring and a banana shaped gametocyte all of you know and also the last hundred images also covered this right so we have covered it multiple times so a banana shaped gametocyte and two dots in a ring usually this kind of a trophozoite and this kind of a gametocyte a banana shaped gametocyte it is a feature of option a plasmodium falciparum i hope most of you have marked it right now okay so this is a repeat question from august also right so there was no issue in this question now also with most of the students Next question number seven. Question number seven states the below given instrument works on which principle? This was very easy, guys. I hope uh, and I believe that Dr. Vinayak has covered it again. And the most important thing, I have also tried to cover it in the snaps. So uh, usually Dr. Vinayak has covered it usually in anesthesia, and also uh, the same image was given in the snaps also in anesthesiology section. If you can, uh, if you have gone through through that session section once so this was the mask which was given which are which is having different kind of valves okay so these different colored valves these are usually flow meters okay these are usually used to maintain a flow of oxygen the flow rate of oxygen is controlled with these kind of valves okay these are different sizes okay so all these six or seven kind of color of valves usually are used for a venturi mask okay venturi or a venti mask which is a variable performance device in this venturi or venti mask the fio to deliver is maximum 60 percent right so definitely this instrument works on which principle so this instrument works on option b venturi principle you can rule out easily the other two options haldens effect and bose effect both of these are related to the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve from physiology i hope all of you are quite aware okay so and boyle's principle usually the anesthesia workstation the newer machine of anesthesia it works on the boyle's principle therefore it is known as the boyle's apparatus no issues no issues if you have done one question wrong definitely you would have done four questions right also so don't worry about that okay next question number eight says question number eight says a person sustained a head injury in a road traffic accident he suffered lucid interval which is seen in now i hope nobody okay fixed principle option was also there don't worry it is the venturi principle on which this venti mask works so this question definitely we have covered it on our last medicine uh, session along with that dr manish sir would also have covered it in the medicine sessions multiple times now right it is also covered in forensic medicine also so it is a very commonly repeated topic at as i already told you intracranial hemorrhages one or two questions were ex expected and the same was seen in the examination too it is a very easy question rather we discussed a more complicated question like this a period of consciousness between two periods of unconsciousness which is known as lucid interval right and they in the exam they directly gave that lucid interval is seen in so lucid interval all of you are correct it is seen in option c extra dural hemorrhage very good it is seen in extra dural hemorrhage i hope none of you have me uh, if you have marked it wrong right 
moving further talking about the next one now guys question number nine here we are the question was <coughs> a repeated one from ophthalmology and it was a very easy question where it says satellite legions are a feature of and satellite legions are a feature of all of you are quite aware rather i have discussed it also in ma'am's notes also shani ma'am's notes also you can find it that the most pathognomic feature of a fungal corneal ulcer are satellite lesion this we have discussed right so please remember the most pathognomic this was a repeat question which was asked in this fashion earlier the most pathognomic feature of a fungal corneal ulcer and this time they asked just satellite lesions are a feature of and the answer to this question would be option a fungal corneal ulcer right along with that definitely we can find a ring uh, immunological ring of weasley along with that a uh, ring also with feathery margins and a fixed and unsterile hypopalm right so this is usually the features of fungal corneal ulcer whereas bacterial corneal ulcer we will find usually a mobile and a sterile hypopalm as we have discussed it multiple times in the questions also and the most common cause of fungal corneal ulcer is definitely aspergillus right and the previously definitely there were repeat questions from acanthamoeba ulcers also for those who are going to appear for the exam let me clear it acanthamoeba ulcer is the most painful ulcer okay please remember and the uh, it is commonly associated or the most specific ulcer associated with uh, contact lens users moving further to question number 10 guys and the question was again is even i feel from paper 1 mark satellite lesions on image and asked to identify okay so it was again an easy one we have drew it also so definitely a ring shaped ulcers and there are lesions all around it definitely just like a satellite revolves revolves around the planet so this was again satellite lesions and a feature of fungal corneal ulcer okay next question number 10 most common cause of blindness and i'm not sure why people have marked it wrong because the question clearly mentioned that the most common cause of blindness in childhood right and if childhood was mentioned as we have discussed multiple number of times right and qrs also you would have discussed this and along with that we have discussed this in optha we have discussed this in psm repetitively that most common cause of blindness if asked that was cataract but if in childhood is mentioned definitely children are given vitamin a till 5 years of age the main reason being to prevent xerophthalmia right so please remember the answer to this question was vitamin a deficiency that is xerophthalmia and children in india usually are given vitamin a solution till 5 years of age only reason being to prevent xerophthalmia because the incidence was much much higher okay before vitamin a was started in the national immunization schedule if they ask the most common cause of blindness in adults definitely that is cataract and i have mentioned also that the most common cause of cataract ma'am has written the first line of cataract is most common cause of cataract is senility if senility or old age is the most common cause of cataract definitely it could not be the answer for childhood right glaucoma congenital glaucoma is not very much common as compared to the other causes refractive errors though they are seen but they would rather lead to ocular morbidity or disease not directly to ocular mortality or blindness this also we have discussed multiple times can people do it came it is a ofta question definitely it can also come from psm as well question number 11 states now a female was having a whitish vaginal discharge with fishy odor microscopic examination shows clue cells and whiff test was positive on a koh mount the drug used for treatment or in this case is now what more clues you need in a question like this definitely a very easy obg question repeated multiple number of times from vaginitis we also discussed this in the qrs in the last session dr prasanth sir would also definitely has discussed it multiple times he has told you that these questions are being commonly repeated we have also discussed it right all the <coughs> types of vaginitis we discussed in the last session where i mentioned that in bacterial vaginosis usually there is a whitish discharge there are presence of clue cells which are vaginal epithelial cells loaded with bacteria the whiff test on potassium uh, hydroxide mount would be positive right and there would be a ammoniacal or a fishy odor from the discharge and all of this would be your amsels criteria 
right? So the condition would be bacterial vaginosis caused by Gardnerova vaginalis. And we have mentioned that in these conditions, both other conditions, we usually treat the uh, treat both the partners. But in bacterial vaginosis, definitely only the female is treated. This was from the QRS. So only the female is treated and the drug of choice for this condition as we discussed it was metronidazole. So metronidazole is the drug of choice for two types of vaginitis, trichomoniasis as well as bacterial vaginosis. Whereas the drug of choice for candidiasis would be fluconazole. Right? I hope all of you have marked it right. No mistakes in this. Right? Moving further now, question number 12, a patient was brought to the OPD with complaints of recurrent episodes of palpitations, sweating, dyspnea and insomnia. He suffered from severe COVID infection three months ago. That is what I got to know. It was mentioned three months ago where he was admitted in the ICU. What is the likely diagnosis? So this was a question of psychiatry definitely covered in multiple sessions. Patient was brought to OPD with complaints of recurrent episodes of palpitations, sweating, dyspnea and insomnia. Definitely palpitations, sweating, dyspnea, insomnia. All of these features are of anxiety. Right? All of these features are of anxiety. And such intense anxiety attacks are definitely known as panic attacks. Right? But what the question had straightforward mentioned that there were recurrent episodes of these uh, anxiety symptoms or panic attack symptoms first thing. So recurrent episodes definitely would lead to a panic disorder first thing. But if the panic disorder is associated with some history, what history was given? He suffered from severe COVID infection three months ago where he was admitted in the ICU. Definitely there is a history of stress given. So as if there is a history of stress given as we have mentioned in PTSD also when we were discussing that in cases of PTSD there would be a history of trauma there can be a history of accident or a chronic illness okay something like this definitely would be mentioned in the question and in the same manner in this question also uh, the same kind of history was given there was a history of severe COVID infection and admission to ICU definitely this is a history of stress associated with recurrent panic attacks where the answer should be option B post traumatic stress disorder because the symptoms are like coming after three months so definitely if the symptoms come after one month right I hope all of you are clear with this if the symptoms of anxiety or panic attacks come after one month of a stress uh, trauma incident definitely it is counted on to as a post traumatic stress disorder if they come before one month it is counted on to as a acute stress disorder right I hope this is clear with everybody now. Moving to the next question, question number 13. The below given image finding is seen in. And it was a very easy one, I hope so, because definitely in NAM session also you would have gone through it. In QR, in ophthalmology chanting also, I have mentioned it, and again in QRS also. So it was repeated multiple number of times, guys. So definitely I told you, like, I told you that leukocoria is seen in two conditions, okay? It is the most common presentation of two conditions. First is your congenital cataract and second is your retinoblastoma. So in both these conditions, definitely you will find a white abnormal pupillary reflex, right? That important thing I mentioned in this this image also that leukocoria ki most common causes retinoblastoma. So if you need to mark one out of them, definitely the answer should be option C, retinoblastoma. Okay, please remember. So option C, retinoblastoma is the most common cause of leukocoria. Whereas it can also be seen in congenital cataract. Please remember. Whereas congenital glaucoma, I have told you multiple times that it usually presents with a bull's eye known as buff. Thalmos. So this was also a kind of a repeated question because in NEET PG also congenital glaucoma question was present, congenital cataract present was uh, question was present like one to two years back, and retinoblastoma definitely is a commonly repeated topic, right? So easy one again. Moving to question number fourteen, the below given image finding is known as again a very easy one. We have discussed it. If there is inward turning of the lower eyelid, okay. So here we have discussed inward turning of the eyelid is known as what? Under ki taraf agar hai definitely, so it would be known as option B entropion, right? If it is an inward turning of eyelid, it would be known as entropion. If it is an outward turning of eyelid, it would be known as 
ऑप्शन ए सीटाजोलाइड विच इज अ कार्बोनिक एंड हाइड्रेज इनहिबिटर राइट सो ये तो रट चुके थे सब किसी ने मिस्टेक नहीं करी ना इसमें आई होप ऑप्शन ए असिटाजोलाइड वॉज आंसर टू द ड्रग ऑफ चॉइस फॉर माउंटेन सिकनेस वेर एज ड्रग ऑफ चॉइस फॉर मॉर्निंग मोशन सिकनेस वुड बी स्कोपोलोमीन प्लीज रिमेंबर ड्रग ऑफ चॉइस फॉर मोशन सिकनेस वुड बी स्कोपोलोमीन ऑल्सो नोन एज हायोसिन okay it is also known as hyoscine right very good and uh, last was we have also discussed about one more sickness that was drug of choice for morning sickness in pregnancy doxylamine was the drug right important so please remember this i feel it is a quite easy one so definitely please remember guys nowadays now they will start giving you short histories definitely histories would be present in question and you need to be ready for that so this is the pattern which has changed we could not expect them to change now right next question was question number 16 and in this question i got a very clear um, recall from most of the students that according to mtp act of 2021 was surely mentioned right so according to mtp act of 2021 medical termination of pregnancy can be done up to how many weeks right so according to the recent amendment all of us were quite aware and we discussed also that ye question tak aaya nahi hai kabhi bhi aa sakta hai and it fortunately came in this examination as discussed in the qr session so mtp act uh, mtp according to the recent amendment can be done up to option c 24 weeks i hope nobody has marked it wrong now right and i have also discussed one other question in the same chanting session uh, from presenter's notes uh, we have discussed that usually the drug of choice uh, yeah and usually the drug of choice this was another question where a, a pregnant female wants to undergo a medical termination of pregnancy and which is the drug preferred right and that also we have discussed here itself in the image you can see the snap from the qrs session so the drug we have discussed it is a anti progesterone drug is given first to kill the fetus that is mifepristone ru486 followed by that we give misoprostol which is a prostaglandin even analog which induces labor right and therefore it would be expelled out okay so this also the second question of obg also we have discussed right over here so two questions from mtp came in this session right Going further to question number seventeen, a person was a person was taking clindamycin for a pre-existing infection and was presented with complaints of watery diarrhea and pain abdomen. The likely organism responsible for this condition is. So now again a question we have discussed it in pharmacology also. Uh, the nature would have also covered it in his notes. we have discussed this multiple times in pharma also we had also one recall question so it is a repeated question again so if there is a intake of some broad spectrum antibiotic drug definitely we will suspect pseudomembranous colitis and further it was clarified even so a person was taking clindamycin as we have discussed in pseudomembranous colitis guys the drugs which are most commonly responsible were discussed the most common cause of pseudomembranous colitis the most common drug would be third generation cephalosporins followed by clindamycin followed by clindamycin so it is the second most common drug leading to pseudomembranous colitis right so please remember uh, clindamycin intake history was given 
Along with that, after that, the patient complains of watery diarrhea and pain abdomen, usually features of colitis and the likely organism responsible for this condition. Very good guys. I hope all of you marked it correct. It is option C, Clostridium difficile, right? So Clostridium difficile, we also discussed the toxin even, right? I told you that toxin lecithinase is released by Clostridium difficile, which, in, which causes inflammation of the intestine. Okay, and the pseudomembrane is formed over the colon. Right? So, lecithinase is the toxin. And Clostridium difficile is the most common organism. And most common drug is third generation cephalosporine followed by clindamycin. Okay? Uh, Clostridium perfringens or Welch, I uh, hope all of you know now, it causes gas gangrene. Or, jaha jaha air hogi, waha waha the causative agent would be perfringens. Like in emphysematous pyelonephritis, emphysematous cholecystitis. All of this were discussed in micro also, in such session and in mine also. Okay, so important. Then Clostridium titani or call it is a cause of titanus, right? Important. Moving further to question number 18, guys. Now, a male patient was prescribed a drug for hypertension, and after a few months, he complains of gynecomastia, which is the drug responsible for this condition. I hope all of you have marked it right now. Also discussed in the last medicine recall question, also discussed in pharma chanting, also in your pharma notes. Okay, we have discussed the mnemonic disco. None of have, uh, none of you might have marked it wrong now, right? So male patient was prescribed drug for hypertension. After a few months, he complains of gynecomastia, that is enlargement of the breast, and the drug responsible for this condition. So uh, disco drugs are usually disco drugs usually lead to a side effect of gynecomastia, and these disco drugs DI goes for digoxin, S goes for spironolactone, right? C goes for your cimetidine, and O goes for your estrogens. Right, I hope all of you are quite aware of this. So the answer to this question was option A, spironolactone, which is a potassium sparing diuretic. And when I was telling you the treatment for constant in the last session, I just asked you and you all have answered it quite well that spironolactone belongs to the disco group of drugs and it is a cause of gynecomastia. I hope all of you remember this now. Moving further to the next one, question number 19. Question number 19 says, during an investigation, below given corpse was found. What kind of odor will be there from this corpse? So it was first thing was which was mandatory was to actually identify this corpse. So this corpse usually is a mummified corpse. So, okay, please remember. So mummification was seen in this dead body, right? In this corpse or dead body, we, we would find mummification. Okay, this question was like, teacher is teaching the students about gynecomastia. Okay, 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 okay. I got to know like this. So, uh, anyways, the answer would remain the same. That is pyronolactone. Yeah, so the it was mummification, definitely, right? So, there are three types. Usually, we would find adipose here. Adipose here is saponification of the dead body. Putrefaction, which is degradation by the bacteria or microorganisms. And last is mummification, which is usually found in hot tropical countries like Egypt, Vagera, right? And this definitely would be discussed by Dr. Vikas in a session. We also have it in uh, FMG snaps. So, this was a mummified dead body and definitely a mummified dead body would be option B, odorless, right? Pungent smell, okay? Usually, please remember, pungent smell would usually be seen in cases of putrefaction when it is degraded by some microorganisms. Then we can find some pungent smell. Then rancid smell, definitely, it is seen in cases of fat. When fat is when oil is then we actually find a rancid butter smell. So, please remember, usually it is found in cases of adipose here. Right, in cases of adipose here, where there is saponification of fat, in that condition we could find a rancid smell. Garlic odor is usually suggestive of poisonings like OPC poisoning, arsenic poisoning or phosphorus poisoning. In this condition, the answer would be option B, odorless. Question number 20, the below given test is known as a very easy one, commonly repeated one, covered by sir in his last session also in the QRS. We have also discussed it multiple number of times, FMG snaps also have this image. I hope none of you have marked it wrong. Bilkul mark nahi kara hoga galat. So please remember the image was telling us some brown rhombic crystals. Okay. And these brown rhombic crystals are usually nothing but hemian crystals. Right. So these brown rhombic crystals are hemian crystals. And that hemian crystals usually they are seen in cases of option D. Teekman's test. 
Okay, option D, Tiekman's test, right? So, Takayama was a repeated question where, where we will find pink feathery hemochromogen crystals, right? And Tiekman's in this, we find brown rhombic crystals made up of hemium, right? Precipitin test is also a blood test. So, Takayama, Tiekman's and Precipitin all are the blood test, whereas Barberio's is a test performed on the seminal stains where we will find yellow needle shaped crystals okay barberio's test and along with that we also have one florence test where we find some brown colored crystals okay that is your florence test but it is a seminal test not a blood test moving further to next question question number 21 it says a pregnant woman comes to the opd for antenatal checkup and she was diagnosed with hypertension some people say directly it was given that it is a pregnancy induced hypertension so uh, anyways the answer to this question would remain the same pregnant woman coming to opd for antenatal checkup diagnosed with hypertension which is the safe drug now some people say the question mentioned that which is the safe drug to be used or some people say that the question did not mention any safe drug it was just mentioning which antihypertensive drug can be used okay so anyways the answer according to my knowledge it would remain the same i hope uh, most of you have marked it right because this uh, definitely they had tricked you over here because i've uh, like everybody of we have discussed that labitalol is the drug of choice for pregnancy induced hypertension which is alpha plus beta blocker oral labitalol for maintenance and for hypertensive crisis iv labitalol so they tricked you over here they asked a previous drug of choice so the previous drug of okay safe was not mentioned no worries so okay so please remember they uh yeah, they asked just a previous drug of choice and according to JNC, uh, Joint National Committee aid guidelines definitely, they still consider option B, methyl dopa to be the drug of choice for hypertension in pregnancy, right? So, methyl dopa should have been your answer because hydralazine definitely, it can, like on a prolonged use, it can lead to cyanide poisoning, like sodium nitroprusside, hydralazine also has some risk, though it is a safer drug, but definitely we'll try to avoid it because if we have a safer option like alpha, two agonists like methyl dopa or uh, clonidin in the option alpha methyl dopa or clonidin in the option definitely will try to avoid any other drugs which will cause any amount of risk for the fetus right so the answer to this question would be methyl dopa which is alpha 2 agonist used in cases of pregnancy induced hypertension and it was the previous drug of choice also according to jnc 8 right ace inhibitors definitely are avoided thiazides are not preferred in pregnancy Moving further to question number 22, a diabetic patient was started on some oral hypoglycemic drug and was experiencing hypoglycemic symptoms. Now, I'm not sure if hypoglycemic symptoms were mentioned or directly uh, the question mentioned it likewise. Which is the most likely drug responsible? Now, also discussed in notes, also we have discussed multiple times in the chanting sessions also, right, the same question from Pharma. Diabetic patient on some oral hypoglycemic agent. Now she is experiencing hypoglycemic symptoms. So now most likely drug responsible. As we have discussed in the session that the most common drug responsible for causing hypoglycemia. Like if we talk about the hypoglycemic agents or the drugs used in diabetes, the most common drug responsible for causing hypoglycemia, definitely the answer should be insulin. But as the question did not have insulin because it was mentioning about an oral hypoglycemic drug, definitely the second answer should be sulfonyl ureas, right? The second answer should be a sulfonyl ureas because after insulin, the maximum risk of hypoglycemia is seen with sulfonyl ureas. I hope uh, most of you have marked it right. Yeah, they just mentioned symptoms of hypoglycemia. Great. So now, according to this one, so the answer would be option B, glipizide, which is a sulfonyl urea. We have discussed this. Which oral drug has maximum chances of hypoglycemia? So it should be sulfonyl urea, like glipizide, having maximum chances. Though it can also be seen with other drugs. Okay, but maximum is seen with this. Right. Moving further to question number 23. Question number 23 states, a person traveled from Assam to Delhi to his hometown and experienced fever for four days and was brought to the emergency with complaints of altered sensorium, some mentioned hallucinations and a strange behavior. Peripheral blood smear prepared for malarial parasite revealed Plasmodium falciparum species. Now people told me that Plasmodium falciparum was mentioned in the question itself. Now they are asking you the preferred 
preferred drug for management the same question was discussed in the pharmacology uh, chanting in the last session definitely uh, sir would have uh, sir have also mentioned in the class itself then sir because uh, this was a recall question a repeat question and i hope no uh, none of you have marked it wrong because we have spent almost 5 to 7 minutes on this question in the in that particular session also okay so it was some uh, same kind of a question where a man traveled from northeast and developed fever chills rigors altered sensorium so definitely we discussed that if any of the cns symptoms are mentioned like altered sensorium hallucination strange behavior it is most likely to be plasmodium falciparum whereas in this question they have directly given it it is plasmodium falciparum because plasmodium falciparum is the only cause for cerebral malaria right and cerebral malaria is counted on to as a complicated malaria and in com cases of complicated malaria definitely will not prefer oral drugs right so though the answer should have been like artesunates wagera because the man traveled to delhi and then he developed fever so if the man traveled to delhi so it would be a drug or the drugs should be some agents which are used all over india except the northeast right like artesunate plus sulfadoxine pyrimethamine but at this condition mentioned uh, that the patient has cns manifestation so the answer would change that would be option c iv artesunate this was discussed intravenous artesunate should be preferred in this case right artemether and lumefantrine are the drug of choice for Uh, malaria in the northeast where artesunate and sulfadoxine pyrimethamine combination is usually the drug of choice for malaria and rest all parts of india okay rest of india right i hope none of you have marked it wrong quinine is usually preferred in cases of complicated malaria in the first trimester of pregnancy whereas in second trimester of pregnancy second and third we usually try to shift from quinine to artesunate again okay in cases of complicated malaria otherwise the drug of choice for malaria in pregnancy remains chloroquine and to prevent relapses we give primaquine this was pretty easy question number 24 says an elderly patient was taking anti hypertensive drug but started experiencing cough which of the following anti hypertensive drug is more likely to cause the side effect very easy question all of you knew the answer discussed in sessions uh, uh, your notes would have the first line in ace inhibitors right that the most common side effect because this was a repeat question again because angioedema pe question aaya tha right neat pg mein bhi tha and asset mein bhi tha uh, in fmg also we had a question on angioedema so definitely cough was expected this time so dry cough is usually a side effect of ace inhibitors and the answer to this question would be option c lecithin pril all the pril drugs we discussed they were ace inhibitors so usually uh, lecithinopril like drugs will have angioedema and dry cough as their side effects and the basic reason being they lead to increase levels of bradykinin in the body okay they cause increase levels of bradykinin in the body which is responsible for causing dry cough right i hope this is fine metoprolol is a beta blocker okay usually causing bronchospasm agara contraindicated in asthma right chlorothiazide definitely leads to hyperglycemia hyperuricemia so contraindicated in gout okay nifedipine is a calcium channel blocker next question the uh, question number 25 identify the bone marked in the image below and uh, this was a repeat question where a superior view of the foot was given maybe one foot would have been given in the x ray uh, question from anatomy okay definitely this bone was marked and it was pretty easy to identify guys i hope none of you have marked it wrong okay all of these are your metatarsals okay this is your cuneiform bones medial <coughs> uh, intermediate and the lateral cuneiforms and a boat shaped bone was marked and this boat shaped bone which uh, comes just behind the cuneiform bone or just in uh, ahead of the heel bone or known as calcaneum this bone is known as option d navicular so it is a boat shaped bone a repeat question a very easy one though right i hope nobody has marked it wrong somewhere over here there is the presence of talus and beneath talus there would be your calcaneum and this is your medial cuneiform right next one question number 26 make an a uh, sound problem uh there is some construction work going on i hope that's the reason why there is a sound problem just let me know if i am pretty audible now so i can raise my voice somewhat mechanism of action of doxycycline was asked as we also discussed in the session sir also might have told you that definitely mechanism of actions usually are asked and they are commonly asked from the antimicrobial drugs uh, right 
and from antimicrobial drugs either from antifungal or antibiotics they usually uh, tend to ask the questions and it was a very easy question i hope doxycycline belongs to the tetracycline group of drugs okay and that table we have discussed already in uh, tnd also everywhere right so it belongs to tetracycline group of drugs and we discussed that at drugs at means two groups amino glycosides and tetracyclines usually bind at the 30s subunit they usually bind at the 30s subunit of the bacterial uh, bacteria and they inhibit the protein synthesis so the answer to this question was option a protein synthesis inhibition amino glycosides and tetracyclines usually bind at the 30s subunit whereas the other drugs like chloramphenicol they bind at the 50s subunit right macrolides and uh, chloramphenicol mlc was the mnemonic for 50s subunit right i hope you remember that dna gyrase inhibitors would be your quinolones right these are your quinolone drugs dna gyrase inhibitor folate synthesis inhibitor as usually your trimethoprim okay so it is your trimethoprim or sulfonamide group of drugs sulfonamides right i hope this was discussed already Hosel wall synthesis inhibitor definitely all the beta lactam group of drugs vancomycin etc all of they come in cell wall synthesis inhibitors moving further to question number 27 a patient suffering from pulmonary tb underwent a gene expert assay uh, and was found he was resistant to isoniazid rifampicin kanamycin and ciprofloxacin which type of resistance is seen in this patient definitely this was discussed by dr dinesh sir also by psm faculty also and uh, we have also repeated it multiple times now uh, sir would have also mentioned in his micro sessions vikas sir so like uh, i hope there was no issue with this because we have discussed it multiple times right so please remember guys please remember a case of resistance if comes first of all there can be either mono drug resistant when the patient is resistant to any one of the first line anti tubercular drug hrzes isoniazid rifampicin pyrazinamide ethambutol or streptomycin any one of this resistance is known as mono drug resistance then if the patient has resistance to isoniazid plus rifampicin this condition is known as multi drug resistant tb okay this is known as multi drug resistant tb rifampicin resistance means resistance to rifampicin which is commonly seen next extremely drug resistant tb please remember guys as we have already discussed it is usually extremely drug resistant tb right <laughs> extensively drug resistant tb ne discuss kiya tha humne right it was extremely drug resistant the tb that we have discussed already in the answers so i hope this was fine where there is resistance to isoniazid plus rifampicin plus any one of the second line injectables plus one of the fluoroquinolones right this was the case we have discussed extremely drug resistant tb ed xdr tb we discussed right it was written as xdr tb and total drug resistant tb we discussed that usually if there is resistance to all the available anti tubercular drugs and uh, the drug of choice for that like the recent drugs which are used for extremely drug resistant tb these are usually drugs like belamine belamine or uh, sorry belamine or belaquiline and this was a repeat question next question number 28 a patient was taking a platinum based chemotherapy and was experiencing nausea and vomiting the drug given for prevention of nausea and vomiting in this patient is i told you always try to remember the end of the like the end of the group definitely okay if you remember the suffixes of the groups it would not have been a, a huge task to mark this question but if you have not uh, been aware of the it is extremely drug resistant tb so like this uh, platinum based chemotherapy we discussed the most emetogenic anti cancer drug is cisplatin right the most emetogenic anti cancer drug is usually cisplatin right it is cisplatin we discussed and in the question itself they give you that uh, platinum based chemotherapy was given and the person started experiencing nausea and vomiting and the drug of choice for prevention of nausea vomiting we have discussed the drug of choice for chemotherapy induced vomiting or radiotherapy induced vomiting that is nothing but your 
cetron group of drugs like onden cetron so just if the name was changed your answer should not change it is palomo cetron in this question okay whereas domperidone promethazine or doxorubicin all are anti emetic drugs but definitely the drug of choice would be palomo cetron next question number 29 says you are posted in emergency and a patient presented to the emergency after a road traffic accident okay the patient presented to the emergency after a road traffic accident with a head injury you suspect raised intracranial pressure due to a underlying cerebral edema so the patient is having underlying cerebral edema which drug is to be given i hope this is like a uh, fine so uh, just Correcting my last question, it is extensively drug resistant TB. Sorry, it is extensively drug resistant TB. This we have discussed already. Okay, just correcting it. No issues with this. I hope all of you have marked it extensively drug resistant TB. We have discussed it that that way in the uh, session also, right? Extensively drug resistant TB. So answer to that to that particular question would be option D, right? So I hope this has answered your query, uh, query Priyanka. So you are posted in emergency and patient presented to emergency after RTA head injury is there there is raised ICP and there is underlying cerebral edema which drug is to be given very easy the answer to this question would be option B mannitol again discussed as we have discussed in our sessions also in notes also that please remember in cases of active cerebral hemorrhage definitely mannitol would be contraindicated in cases of any active intracranial hemorrhage mannitol would be contraindicated but in case Cases to reduce cerebral edema, drug of choice would be what? Drug of choice would be mannitol, which is an osmotic diuretic. Right? We have discussed this. The contraindications also we discussed in the chanting sessions of mannitol. I hope none of you have marked it wrong. Okay, acetazolamide was also there. Next uh, would be question number thirty. An elderly hypertensive patient presents with dyspnea, palpitations, exercise intolerance, and generalized edema, more pronounced in the lower limbs. the drug given to reduce edema in this case i hope this was a very easy question it is a repeat again from medicine and overlap pharma also so this is very easy elderly hypertensive patient if the patient presents with dyspnea palpitations exercise intolerance generalized edema usually they are talking that the heart has Uh, like fall weak and working okay the heart is about to fail so now they are more likely talking about chf congestive heart failure right there are features like edema okay usually seen in cases of right ventricular failure right due to a uh, pooling of blood there would be dyspnea due to pulmonary edema there would be palpitations exercise intolerance so they were definitely talking about chf congestive heart failure and they are just asking you the drug given to reduce edema in this case would be as all of you are quite aware that relative contraindication of pulmonary edema is mannitol right i hope none of you have marked it mannitol because please remember in cases of chf usually or in cases of pulmonary edema we tend to avoid mannitol Or rather, we prefer a drug known as option B, furosemide, which is a loop diuretic. So the answer to this question, the better drug to be used in this question in cases of CHF for overcoming edema, preventing edema, would be furosemide. Okay, it would be furosemide. Hi, Yash. So it would be furosemide, right? I hope none of you have marked it wrong. Let's move ahead. Question number thirty-one. A six-year-old child was brought to the OPD with complaints that he blinks fast and stares at something for twenty seconds and is blank after the episode. Important. He is blank after the episode. The drug preferred in this condition is. So now, uh, guys, definitely you would have discussed it in the medicine sessions also. We have discussed it in our, our session also. Mani sir would have also mentioned it that epilepsy is an important topic. So definitely, at least one question is expected from epilepsy. This time also it appeared in the exam in ASMG notes. It was present that uh, this question also you might have solved in the test also. So, but here the age was actually important. But let just let me know if etosuximide was in the option. If you Have to get confused. You would have got confused with ethosuximide only in this. Otherwise, so it was very easy. Yeah, very good. The provisional diagnosis in this case, the provisional diagnosis in this case would be absence seizures, right? So we have discussed this when a child 
looks or stares at a particular object for almost 20 second okay and uh, definitely he is having poor school performance okay and uh, so these are usually features of absent seizures and for absent seizures the drug of choice is very good it is option B Valproid as we have discussed to be more specific less than 4 years the drug of choice for absence seizures would be ethosuximide because it is a safer drug to be used. Less than 4 years the drug of choice for absence seizures is ethosuximide. But after 4 years of age definitely Valproid should be used. So if you are pretty sure about the age that it was 6 year and though ethosuximide was in the option definitely the answer would still remain Valproid there. Okay. Please remember, yeah. Diazepam, if given, please remember, diazepam uh, could not be given in cases of absence seizures. Uh, it can only be given to uh, abort the episode. It can only be given to stop the episode, but it is not the preferred drug, definitely. Okay, diazepam is the drug of choice, definitely, but in cases of febrile seizures. Yeah, look now, diazepam is the drug of choice. We have discussed this already. Diazepam is the drug of choice in cases of febrile seizures. So, if the question mentioned something like febrile seizures, then and then only your answer should change that it should be diazepam. Mostly IV or rectal diazepam we prefer in the uh, in between uh, uh, during the episodes, and in between, we can give a oral diazepam even right so diazepam or clobazam can be used moving further phenytoin is usually preferred for focal seizures and not in cases of uh, absence seizures question number 32 a 65 year old patient presents with low back pain weakness and edema serum electrophoresis shows presence of m peak this i got to know that serum electrophoresis revealing m peak was mentioned in the question x-ray skull and spine are given below most of the people have said that only x-ray skull was given some said x-ray spine or other bone was also given along with it what is the likely diagnosis? So, Sarkari question as we discussed, yeah, very good. So, a multi multiple myeloma, Sarkari question. Usually, I told you the most important thing to remember. I if a young male presents with low backache, your diagnosis will more likely go towards ankylosing spondylitis. Whereas, if an elderly male or elderly female presents with low backache, your diagnosis will uh, be inclined towards multiple myeloma. Please remember. Okay, tuberculosis was the option. So one of the options can be TB. Most likely from hyperthyroid uh, hyperparathyroidism was not the option. Okay, only skeleton was given. So on skeleton also you will find some uh, just like the spine and skeleton also you will find some punched out uh, osteolytic lesions, right? I hope uh, you know that in multiple myeloma there is bone eating. Okay, bone eating occurs that leads to osteolysis. So usually we will find punched out osteolytic regions and these multiple punched out osteolytic regions in skull will give a characteristic appearance of raindrop skull so a raindrop skull definitely mentioned in the elderly person osteolytic regions in other uh, parts morning stiffness uh, okay okay and ankylosing spondylitis usually yeah, morning stiffness can be present so in this question mp was given what more is needed definitely as we know in multiple myeloma there are abnormal proteins which are formed these are usually light chains of antibodies which are formed uh, if they are excreted in urine these are known as benz jones proteins these are usually nothing but the kappa and lambda chains only kappa and lambda chains of the antibodies are formed Right, there is plasma cytosis, so it is a plasma cell uh, disorder. Lytic region was mentioned, so even more easier for you to uh, diagnose the condition. So the answer to this question would be option B, multiple myeloma. If hyperparathyroidism was the option, we have discussed it already in the images part also last one, that in hyperparathyroidism, there usually would be rugger jersey spine. Alternating bands, they have the spine, pe, rugger jersey spine, and usually a skull uh, would more likely resemble a pepper pot skull or a salt and pepper skull. Very minute lesions would be present. Osteolytic lesions, but very minute, right? <coughs> and in ankylosing spondylitis, usually the spine will show dagger sign or the bamboo spine and the most characteristic feature is bilateral sacroiliitis. Question number 33, it says a 30 year old male patient presents with pain and swelling at the wrist. The x-ray is given below. The biopsy from the mass reveals multinucleated giant cells. What, which is the most probable diagnosis? So now I am, I was literally not sure why was this question question marked as wrong by most of you definitely this was discussed by Mukul sir in his sessions also multiple number of times we also discussed it multiple times so why was this question marked as wrong I am not sure 
because uh, if we talk about bone tumors i told you that the age and the site of the region plays most important role okay so if the bone lesion uh, if the bone tumor is usually in the first decade we'll more likely think about having sarcoma in second decade more likely about osteosarcoma in third decade we're more likely think about giant cell tumor right so the patient is in the third decade a young male patient so we will usually think about giant cell tumor right important most common site we discuss for giant cell tumor usually it is the distal end of the femur but after that it is upper end of tibia also and the third and most common site is the distal end of the radius also okay and the uh, x-ray was giving a characteristic which appearance so the x-ray was giving a characteristic so bubble appearance okay yeah it is a radial uh, radial head or a distal end of radius tum uh, tumor if uh, this is given at any pathology at the uh, distal end of the radius if given definitely it should be a giant cell tumor unless and until proven otherwise very good yeah, very good yes yeah so please remember this is a soap bubble appearance seen on the distal end of the radius and this is more likely to be a osteoclastoma also known as the giant cell tumor most of the people said multinucleated giant cell was mentioned if not then also it was very easy to diagnose it from this case right osteosarcoma uh, this is giant cell tumor is also a metaphyseal tumor but it extends up to the joints yeah we discussed kiya tha right it extends up to the joints yeah image is also important that's it colis fracture usually would be seen in a elderly osteoporotic uh, or meno post menopausal female right where there is a history of trauma fall on an outstretched hand some people mentioned there was no history of trauma given so definitely colis can be ruled out easily osteosarcoma can be seen at metaphyses but uh, not common at the distal end of radius and sunburst appearance of cord man triangle can be seen galaxy fracture dislocation it is a fracture of distal end of radius and uh, the dislocation of the inferior or the distal radial ulnar joint so which is not seen obviously over here question number 34 now a child was brought with complaints of sore throat and neck swelling on examination a whitish membrane is present in the oropharynx which on peeling bleeds which is the likely cause again sarkari question we discussed uh, vikas sir also discussed in his last session qrs also he mentioned it uh, i feel most uh, like few people have not marked it wrong please uh the theory like the most important i did not get the fourth recall definitely i am not sure about the third second and third recall also so the answer to this question was diphtheria obviously because most of you have marked it right so if a pseudo membrane is seen in diphtheria on the tonsils which extends up to the heart palate if it this pseudo membrane is peeled off or if it is removed definitely it will bleed right this is usually a characteristic of diphtheria if sore throat and neck swelling was present definitely it is a feature of diphtheria where there is a bilateral cervical lymphadenopathy mentioned right and there is no history of dental infection given so ludwig sangina can be ruled out mumps it is usually a uh, cheek swelling it is not a neck swelling it is a cheek swelling because it is a parotitis inflammation of the parotid gland and no membrane is seen in mumps next if i talk about this question most of you were fascinated with this <coughs> okay fourth option was measles thank you so much thank you so much sail so great <sighs> so uh question number so yeah yeah that question i'll include in the next i got that recall i'll include it in the next one question number 35 guys a 25 year old married or unmarried female of the same village who is eighth pass this is the criteria for which healthcare worker definitely indian healthcare system was taught to you, uh, talk to you in great details right i hope and uh, we have discussed it multiple times in the pharma chantings also in the revision sessions also that uh, like this was a newer update which i had mentioned that asha worker should be the uh, resident of the same village every time we used to discuss asha we used to discuss this 25 to 45 year old female okay a resident of the same village select uh, is uh, selected by the gram panchayat a member of the village and health sanitation committee right so uh, what do you uh, need more an important thing i mentioned it yes recommended is 10th pass for sure most of you have made a uh, mistake over here uh, recommended is 10th pass but agar us gaon mein koi 10th pass aurat hi nahi hai if there is no female with 10th pass in that particular village definitely a 8th pass girl or 8th pass female can also be taken as a accredited social health activist known as asha worker and ye we discussed that asha worker is not responsible for delivery right so 
sure shot Asha, right? Sure shot Asha. Because Anganwadi worker, she is responsible for preschool education. So at least she should be 12th pass. So that uh, that is when she can actually uh, like <clears throat> give education to the other uh, children, preschool children, right? So preschool education is an important part of Anganwadi's. So she should be 12th pass. Multi-purpose worker also should be 12th pass. Traditional birth attendant not okay. So Usha was not an option. It was TBA more easy because traditional birth attendant there is no such educational criteria required for Dai. Right? Now next question. Question number 36. Which is the likely triad of Meek syndrome? Multiple times in QRS also we had this discussion of Meek syndrome. Right? I could not include the snaps from everywhere now because <laughs> it was not feasible for me also. So at least I would like to mention this. So likely triad of Meek and pseudo Meek we have discussed. So if it was pseudo Meek in the question, please remember pseudo Meek is usually a triad of Brenner's tumor, a ovarian tumor, right? A Brenner's tumor plus ascites plus pleural effusion. So this is the pseudo Meek syndrome which is associated with Brenner's ovarian tumor. But if it is a Meek uh, syndrome, definitely the answer to this question would be o ovarian fibroma. So Meek syndrome is usually a triad of ovarian fibroma along with ascites along with pleural effusion okay so this is the triad of a meek syndrome and fibroma by the name itself it is a tumor of the fibroblast oma means a benign tumor so the answer to this question should be option a benign ovarian tumor along with ascites along with pleural effusion is the triad of meek syndrome important right so please remember if they would have mentioned brenner's definitely uh, rather than marking definitely 95 percent times brenner's tumor is benign but 5% times, 5% times there is a risk of malignancy in cases of Brenner's tumor. So if a pseudo make was asked, then this would have been a better option to be marked because Brenner shows both. But ovarian fibroma by the name itself, uh, it is easy. Okay, you mark benign, that is important. Great. Next, question number 37. Which structure is palpated in the below given image? Again, image from snaps, you can find it definitely and we also discussed it right uh, we discussed topographical anatomy in the last session where we were discussing like keep uh, like from medial malleolus in and around medial malleolus they definitely ask questions not sure why but they like this part very much so they definitely ask questions in and around this part so usually uh, anterior tibial artery is not palpated over here because see the site of palpation please remember it is behind the medial malleolus and in between the achilles tendon so in between the achilles tendon and the medial malleolus definitely we will try to palpate option b posterior tibial artery by the site itself you have got to know right it is the posterior tibial artery important whereas dorsal is pedis artery which is a branch of the anterior tibial artery it is usually palpated against the nerve Navicular bone. This we discussed earlier. Then the navicular also question discussed earlier, right? So dorsal pedis artery is usually palpated against the navicular bone in between first and second metatarsal, right? So all of these questions had come from anatomy one liners. Moving further to question number thirty-eight, a patient sustained a head trauma and presents to the emergency. Battle sign was seen. Now some are saying <coughs> that battle sign was clearly mentioned. Some are saying that oh, edema over mastoid surface. Or uh, discoloration over mastoid surface was given. So uh, discoloration of over mastoid surface, even it was given, <coughs> it will come to the same point that it is a battle sign. <coughs> Sorry, which is a feature of important. So we have discussed it in surgery, general surgery, and trauma also. In QRS also, I have included both the signs important for anterior cranial fossa fracture. Definitely, it is a counter cowp injury, and we can see periorbital bilateral ecchymosis. These are usually known as what? These are usually known as Rakun's eye or Panda's eye, right? This we discussed for sure. And along with that, in uh, multiple times we have also discussed, in case of middle cranial fossa fractures, definitely we can see a uh, discoloration over the mastoid surface, and that is known as a battle sign. So the answer to this question would be middle cranial fossa fracture. In this, we can see battle sign. So it was very easy. Here, ki yaha kaun saada? Middle cranial fossa saada hai na? So like most of them had said that uh, yeah, bruise over mastoid. So very good. Okay. So most of them have marked posterior cranial fossa fracture. I'm not sure why they would have marked posterior cranial fossa fracture. Question number 39, a female is strict vegetarian since 10 years, presents with pallor, 
फटीग एंड बिलो गिवन पेरिफेर स्मेयर फाइंडिंग वट इज द लाइकली कॉज ओके ब्रूज ओवर मास्टर्ड सर्फेस अगेन इट इज द सेम बैटर साइन ओके आंसर वॉज बैटर साइन so there is because most of them they had given me the recall that the cause was asked okay so then it was even way much easier for you all female is strict vegetarian since 10 years definitely uh, if a female is vegan or vegetarian usually we had discussed there are two vitamins okay there are two vitamins which do not have a plant source ye humne discuss kiya tha two vitamins which do not have a plant source and they would be deficient in vegetarians or vegan individuals those were vitamin d and vitamin b12 right at least vitamin d they can acquire from sunlight so there are less chances of vitamin d deficiency but vitamin b12 cannot be acquired from any other uh, source therefore strict vegetarians the deficiency would more likely be vitamin b12 deficiency that can be further confirmed that there is presence of uh, pallor fatigue so which are features of anemia and the peripheral blood smear confirms the diagnosis here we can see what so please remember here we can see a hyper segmented neutrophil just uh, let me a minute i'm not sure so in this condition we can find a hyper segmented neutrophil guys let me plug in the lappy for a um, while yeah yeah so in this question it was in the peripheral blood smear it was clearly mentioned that there was a hyper segmented neutrophil more than 5 lobes of neutrophil which is a feature of megaloblastic anemia right so it is a feature of megaloblastic anemia which is due to folate and vitamin b12 deficiency but in vegans or vegetarians usually more likely there is a vitamin b12 deficiency along with that there are also some presence of teardrop cells at times teardrop cells whereas वैसे तो characteristic region myelofibrosis का होता है वो right so it is option a vitamin b12 deficiency and yeah i got to know there were three questions from vitamin b12 deficiency there was also a tongue image there was a fissured tongue which was given and vitamin b2 was definitely not an option riboflavin uh, in vitamin b2 otherwise it is a confusion that geographic tongue or atrophic glossitis is seen but as it was not an option definitely vitamin b12 was the answer right so three questions from vitamin b12 so this time actually some topics were very commonly asked ek hi topic do do baar repeat hua cml was also asked two, two questions from cml two questions from mtp three questions from uh, b12 so question number 40 a uh, 35 year old male smoker presents with below given finding he also complains of intermittent claudication which is the most probable diagnosis now what do you need more what do you need more You just need to uh, see that we have discussed रटा दिया आता है कि ऑलेंस क्राइटेरिया फुलफिल हो रहा है या नहीं अ यंग मेल स्मोकर लेस देन फोर्टी फाइव ईयर ओल्ड मेल स्मोकर ये डिस्कस किया था राइट सो यंग मेल स्मोकर विद बिलो गिवन इमेज फाइंडिंग वॉट इज सीन इन दिस इमेज वी कैन फाइंड गैंग्रीन हाइड डिजिट राइट सो यूजली वी कैन फाइंड गैंग्रीनस डिजिट राइट एंड द पेशेंट कंप्लेन्स ऑफ इंटरमीटन क्लॉडिकेशन राइट <laughs> intermittent claudication is when patient starts to walk there would be pain in the calf that is intermittent claudication which is the most probable diagnosis in this condition very good all in criteria is fulfilled less than 45 year old uh, per patient it is a male and uh, therefore there would be distal ischemic signs and symptoms definitely pulselessness so chodo that directly presence of gangrene so no further uh, you need uh, surety to mark this question it is option a thromboangitis obliterans also known as burgers burgers bolo ya burgers bolo so it is burgers yeah uh, if it is burgers disease great so i got to know like it was confusing so i just thought it might be thromboangitis if it is burgers so it is more better it was very easy then right atherosclerosis is a gradual condition frostbite it is usually due to uh, freezing temperature exposure dactylitis is just the inflammation question number 41 says a 55 year old male presents with abdominal discomfort anorexia gum bleeds and weight loss on examination hepatosplenomegaly and pallor was present work up reveals that tlc is high with predominant neutrophilia which is the likely translocation so now as i discussed there were two questions from this condition 55 year old male so elderly male so elderly male hai to ek leukemia to tumne rule out kar liya for sure 
तो ये ल्यूकेमिया ये कैसे पता चला सो प्लीज रिमेम्बर गाइज अबडामिनल डिस्कम्फर्ट anorexia gum bleeds weight loss along with that there is hepatosplenomegaly along with pallor so these are some features of anemia right and work up definitely reveals increased tlc total leukocyte count was high with predominant neutrophilia and if there is neutrophilia definitely it would be myeloid lineage it cannot be lymphoid lineage if there was lymphoid lineage there would have been lymphocytosis so definitely cml uh, sorry cll and all are ruled out anyways all was ruled out first because it is an elderly person so all is the most common malignancy in childhood so it can be ruled out first second we can rule out cll because neutrophilia is mentioned so definitely it is either aml or either it is cml important so please remember usually <coughs> and uh, in this condition the diagnosis was cml and the, they have asked you the most likely translocation so the most likely translocation and in this condition is option b translocation 922 we have discussed this multiple times it is the philadelphia and patho uh, chanting also we discussed tarun sir would have also mentioned it it is the philadelphia chromosome translocation 922 also known as bcr abl gene translocation it is also known as bcr abl gene translocation right we have discussed this philadelphia chromosome right whereas translocation 28 maine bola tha 88 jaha bhi aaye 8 looks like b so translocation 28 814 are associated with burkitt's lymphoma 14 16 is known as pml rara translocation associated with m3 variety of aml okay next is question number 42 a patient presents with hyperpigmented scaly lesions the scrapings from the lesions examined on the 10% koh mount shows spaghetti and meatball appearance causative agent for this condition is a very commonly repeated question again a sarkari question from micro everybody knows this now patient presents with hyperpigmented scaly dr vikas would have covered it definitely uh, very good all of you were my marked it right the answer to this question would be option a malassezia furfur so hypopigmented scaly region definitely it is either tinea also known as pityriasis versicolor pityriasis ka hi matlab matlab hota hai scaling so wherever pityriasis comes there is scaling so it is a question of tinea versicolor scrapings definitely will show spaghetti and meatball appearance and the causative agent would be malassezia furfur right image was given so some people told me that images were less and this image was not given if image was given so it was much easier then question number 43 which epithelium is present in the fallopian tube a very easy question from uh, we can say anatomy and physio also so which epithelium is present in the fallopian tube so i hope all of you know that after ovulation the ovary drops the uh, graafian follicle the ovary from the graafian follicle drops the ova into the fallopian tube the fimbria takes it up and after the fimbria takes it up the ova is actually transferred towards the uterine cavity and kaise transfer hota hai wo okay it is pushed through uh, with the help of the cilia so there would should be presence of cilia na for the movement of the ova in the fallopian tube so the answer to this question would be option a ciliated columnar epithelium okay ciliated columnar epithelium previously there was a question pex cells are seen in so pex cells are also seen in fallopian tube so this was a recall question easy next question number 44 spinal cord now please uh, just confirm this acha image confusing thi no worries agar question mein mention tha baki sab to so now some people are saying that spinal cord level in infants was asked some people are saying spinal cord level in adults was asked so i got to know more people were supporting that spinal cord level in adults was asked so spinal cord in adults and set which level was asked so if they have asked you about adults definitely it is option a l1 yaad rakhna in adults it is usually ends at l1 in both the conditions it will end at the lower border of the vertebra okay infant was asked so guys infants then the answer to this question would become option c l3 okay the answer would become l3 okay so lower border of l3 vertebra in infants usually the spinal cord ends uh not yet the uh, madam question would be discussed most likely in the next session because in today's i have not included it the madam i got to know the medial side of the uh, leg was marked <coughs> okay okay great great i have corrected it question number 45 which are the most common types of renal stones now one liner directly from surgery very easy now acha lower end l3 tha so lower uh, border of l3 would be the most appropriate answer to be marked 
क्वेश्चन नंबर फोर्टी फाइव विच आर द मोस्ट कॉमन टाइप्स ऑफ रीनल स्टोन इतनी बार रिपीट हुआ है नो बडी वुड मेक इट रॉन्ग Very good, very good, guys. Option B, calcium oxalate. So most common type of renal stones are calcium oxalate stones. Most hardest stones are cysteine stones. Most hardest stones, right? Hardest stones are cysteine stones. Usually, triple phosphate stones are the largest stones, which will take up the shape of the renal pelvic axial system, leading to a staghorn calculi. This was discussed. Again, Sarkari question, renal stones. Very good, calcium oxalate. Very good. Crystals भी हमने बहुत बार डिस्कस किए थे नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन नंबर फोर्टी सिक्स आइडेंटिफाई द बिलो गिवन इमेज फाइंडिंग सो डेफिनेटली समटाइम्स दीज टाइप ऑफ क्वेश्चन कम सो वेदर इट वॉज अपर लेम और लोअर लेम If any of the two digits are fused together, if any of the two digits are fused together, this is a Latin term to be used. Dactyl means it is the finger. Okay, sin का मतलब होता है fusion. So option, uh, so the answer to this question would be option D, sin dactyl. The answer to the answer would be sin dactyl. याद रखना. Poly dactyl means presence of one more finger. रितिक रोशन. ठीक है. Crino dactyl is inward curvature of the fifth finger. Usually seen in Down syndrome. Inward curvature of fifth finger. And last sim. Bracket actually is a uh, what we can say improper development of the hands. Okay, the digits are not well formed in same bracket actually. Short short digits are seen. Okay, clean filter kind of syndrome was mentioned. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so history was given definitely. I'll add it up. Okay, don't worry. I'll add it up. Okay, thank you so much. Moving further, question number forty-seven, which is the most radio-sensitive organ among the following? I'm not sure about the options, but the answer would remain the same because most of you have given me the recall that bone marrow was not definitely mentioned in the option. So, if bone marrow is definitely not mentioned in the option, because we have discussed earlier that the most radio-sensitive tissue, if asked, it would be the bone marrow. Here the answer. Uh, here the question was most radio sensitive organ. So the answer to this question would be option C, ovary. Very good. So gonads or ovaries we discussed. Ovaries or testes. These are the most radio sensitive organs, right? Important. Most radio resistant. If you ask, if we ask about the cells, most radio resistant cells would be your neurons or fibroblasts, right? Acha, urinary bladder was the option. So urinary bladder. Great, great. Thank you so much. Moving further to question number forty-eight, uh, which says soiled cotton swab is to be discarded in. So people were saying questions did not come from PSM. So there were questions from PSM, though from the uncommon topics. Uh, like yeah, as expected, there were less number of questions, but we could find. So this was a very easy. We would uh, we played quiz a number of times in PSM. Now in every session we used to have a quiz on uh, biomedical waste. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. All female reproductive organs were given during cervix operation. Very good. Thank you so much, Anand. Thank you so much. I'll include it. Very good. So, soil, cotton waste, human anatomical waste, chemical waste, microbiological waste, lab waste, everything, dressings. Okay, soil, cotton swabs. Everything would go in the yellow bag, which is discarded by incineration. Right? Gloves, plastics, rubbers, all of these things would go into the red bag, recyclable waste. White container usually contains the scalpels, blades. The shops and blue box usually contains the metallic ware and the glass ware. Yeah, it doesn't need PG repeat. And in Ayna set we discussed there was the wrapper of the gloves was asked, which was uh, which used to be discarded as a general waste in the black bag. Question number forty nine, guys. Which among the following is false about colostrum? Uh, for yellow bag, few more things were mentioned. Okay, 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 okay. Got it, got it. So question number next uh, forty nine. So it is an easy question. Which among following is false about colostrum? Okay, I'm trying. Actually, uh, people are only getting the recalls. People uh, didn't get the proper uh, what we can say the recalls from the examination. So at least I have tried to gather whatever I could get. In some questions, they have definitely recalled some options. Uh, some uh, history that was given. In other, they could not recall it properly. But the answer most likely would be the same, because I have said this before. In clinical cases, the last two lines are most important because they try to ask you the question in the last two lines mainly. So please remember, cholesterol, guys. Please remember. Uh, now we need to mark the false statement. First of all, it is rich in immunoglobulin A. We have discussed this multiple times. <coughs> so 
definitely colostrum is rich in IgA. Okay, it is rich in IgA. Uh, the rich, the, the maximum or high amount of immunoglobulin which is present in any of the bodily secretions would be IgA. It is yellow in color. Yes, it is some straw colored or yellowish in color. Now uh, there is some issues over here. Now most of the students have given me a recall that it was specifically mentioned that there is high amount of fat and sugar content mentioned. If there is high amount of fat and sugar content, guys please remember during colostrum, fat and sugar content is less as compared to uh, the other uh, things which are present. Okay, So please remember amino acids if there was in the option because some people are saying amino acids was the option then this statement uh, is correct because proteins are high. Okay, If proteins are high then amino acids level would be high and minerals are also high in colostrum. So then if amino acids was mentioned in one of the options then your answer would be high amount of fat and sugar content. But if vitamins would be mentioned then definitely you can go otherwise. Okay. Okay. Deep lemon yellow. Okay. Great. Deep lemon yellow. I'll add. Okay. Chal. So as such, in this case, if I have like this was the scenario, then uh, option D would have been the answer. If it was something otherwise, if amino acids were not mentioned, then definitely fat and sugar content. But uh, in that condition, please remember high amount is not present. Say so options. So great. No worries. Next question number 50. A child presented with the below given appearance likely diagnosis is. So I thought I think here also some history was given. The child presented with fever vagera. Okay. Some rash or, or everything was mentioned. Okay. So there was a history. And this image was given. In image there would be a bilateral erythematous rash on both the cheeks. So this is characteristic appearance as discussed in microbiome by sir. So it is a slab cheek appearance. We also have it in the last images, the hundred images that we had. It is a slab cheek appearance. Okay, yes, it is uh, seen in option B, erythema infectiosum. The most co the common causative agent is parvovirus B19. Okay, sap cheek was mentioned even better, even better. So the answer would be parvovirus B19. So great, if sap cheek was mentioned, nothing to be, uh, nothing to worry. Exanthem subitum or roseola infantum, this is due to HHV6 and HHV7, right? It is usually due to HHV6 or HHV7. Molluscum contagiosum, we have discussed, it is a pearly amylicate lesion due to uh, pox virus and acrodermatitis enteropathica, it is due to zinc deficiency, right? Next, okay, great. Question number 51, a patient was diagnosed with COVID and was admitted in ward, but respiratory distress worsened and his condition deteriorated for which he was shifted to ICU. The x-ray chest shows bilateral ground glass opacities. What is the likely diagnosis? I got to know that the x-ray was not present, but it was clearly mentioned that the x-ray chest, uh, they told that bilateral ground glass opacities was mentioned properly in the option, uh, in the question itself. And there was a history of COVID. So these two pointers are enough as we have discussed multiple times. Right. Uh, so a history of COVID and most likely if there is worsening of the symptoms, the patient is likely to go in a complication and it is more likely to be ARDS. Right. And it is further confirmed with the x-ray which shows us brown uh, bilateral ground glass opacities. Okay. So the answer to this question would be option B, acute, uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome. So I got this from multiple like uh, people that they were saying that ground glass opacities ka question tha, ARDS was there. Ground glass is an option. Okay. 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 So ground glass was an option. I got to know that. Okay. Thank you so much. Question number 52. The below given condition is caused by which organism? Repeated multiple times. Sarkari question again. Okay, question was like appearance of COVID on chest X-ray and answer is ground glass opacities in the periphery. Okay, periphery was also mentioned. So, okay. Okay, okay. I'll correct it. So, now I ho hope that this was in the option because most of the people said that condyloma acuminata had come this time also. So, condyloma acuminata is a very commonly repeated question. 
सो कॉन्डालोमा ऑक्यूमिनाटा की कॉज पूछी गई थी एंड द कॉजिटिव एजेंट वुड बी ऑप्शन बी ह्यूमन पैपिलोमा वायरस एचपीवी राइट सो दिस इज एक्चुअली जॉयंट एनोजेनाइटल वॉर्ड्स व्हिच आर यूजुअली कॉज बाय 6 एंड 11 एंड दे आल्सो मेंशन दैट सर्वाइकल कैंसर का कॉजिटिव एजेंट पूछा गया था सर्वाइकल कैंसर एचपीवी 16 एंड 18 सो लाइक इन एचपीवी देयर वर टू क्वेश्चंस लाइक सम पीपल हैव सेड मी दैट फॉर एनोजेनाइटल वॉर्ड्स आल्सो दैट इज कॉन्डालोमा ऑक्यूमिनाटा एज वेल एज फॉर सर्वाइकल कैंसर आल्सो okay the image would not be the same guys but at least uh, there would there was present of words right on the vulva yeah consolidations usually are seen but please remember it is a ground glass opacity there is the complete destruction of the alveoli which is seen so it is better if ground glass opacity was in the option and complication was asked definitely it should be uh, ground glass opacity next question uh, question number 53 Uh, a 45 year old female presented to the emergency after a bike accident she now complains of severe headache which she has never experienced earlier the ncct head is given below likely diagnosis again a uh, intracranial hemorrhage question multiple times repeated in chanting so you all are quite aware sapne rakh liya tha is cheez acche se so female coming after a history of bike accident that means there is a history of trauma which is the most common cause of sh let's see further now complaints of severe headache never experienced earlier so this is a punch line i told you thunder clap headache or worst headache of my life so that is what is mentioned in the question severe headache which she has never experienced earlier right yeah sarkari again so never experienced earlier ncct head is given below i told you if there is opacity in the sylvian fissure and the ventricles definitely it is to be likely a hemorrhage in the subarachnoid space when the blood is admixed with the csf so the answer is straight forward option c subarachnoid hemorrhage in subdural hemorrhage there would have been a crescent shaped opacity intracerebral hemorrhage it is usually intracranial space occupying region along with midline shift okay everything was discussed and a uh, ventricular or biconvex opacity in extra dural bike uh, bike accident was not that trauma history was given people told me that there was a history of trauma given and the question if no uh, history of trauma was also not given two pointers are important worst headache and second uh, the ct scan and the ct so definitely like uh, most people have not actually uh, like uh, they have not been able to recall it properly so that is always a recall so definitely here and there questions would be there some answers would be here and there identify the mark structure so this was very easy and a cadaveric image was given in the question i got to know so like something like this kind of image would have been there a cadaveric image where this structure was marked and this structure is option c epiglottis so it was very easy a leaf shaped cartilage usually seen in the uh, supraglottis it is your epiglottis right and uh, the depression that you can see the space in between the base of the tongue and the epiglottis this is known as your valvula and <coughs> the folds or uh, yeah the mucosal folds which connect the glottis to the retinoid cartilage these are known as your ary epiglottic folds okay important and base of tongue is somewhere here okay so it was pretty clear recall bias is seen yeah recall bias is seen a patient was given clomiphene citrate here also i am not sure because only people are recalling the image none of them has given a proper history so uh, if you could help me in this uh, okay 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 got it got it so next one a patient was given clomiphene citrate ultrasound picture of ovary is given below likely diagnosis so why people confused it with pcod i am not sure we have discussed it multiple times that in pcod there would be 2 to 6 mm size follicles small small follicles because the follicles could not grow and in between there would be a thick stroma which gives a necklace pattern or a pearl uh, pearl of neck sorry a string of pearl pattern usually in pcod right but in this you can see there are large large follicles and if there is okay there was history of ART, okay 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 so if you have uh, given infertility treatment is going on that means clomiphene citrate is given definitely and it is for infertility treatment we usually give uh, clomiphene citrate for increasing the size of follicles first and second for ovulation induction for these two things so therefore all the fo follicles would grow big in size at least we will uh, take 3 to 4 follicles and we will 
keep them okay we will actually fertilize them and we will keep them as embryos okay frozen embryos would be kept and one of the frozen embryos would be uh, like to implanted in the uterus this is what is a method of in, uh, in vitro fertilization in which ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome is done so the answer to this question would be option b ohss ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome great 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 next question number 56 maximum amniotic fluid is present at what week of gestation it is very easy so IVF, it is, yeah, clomiphene citrate is more likely used for IVF treatment for ovulation induction. So maximum amniotic fluid is present at what week of gestation? Very easy. Why, 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 why you are making it wrong right now? Why are you people making it wrong? I'm not sure. So as I mentioned in the QR sessions also, and sir would have mentioned, Prasan sir has clearly mentioned in all his notes that maximum amniotic fluid is seen at 34 weeks, right? Maximum amniotic fluid is usually seen at 34 weeks, which is 1000 ml, right? And after 34 weeks, usually the amniotic fluid goes down to 800 ml around 36 weeks, okay? So the nearest option to this would be your 32 weeks because in this, the fluid will go down towards 36. Whereas the fluid is rising in cases of 32 to 34. So please remember the answer would be option of 40, 42 to even better because in 40, 42 in post term babies, the amniotic fluid level even goes down below for 800 ml. So it is 32 weeks the answer. The more closest option you need to mark. More people are saying that 34 weeks was not an option. If 34 was an option, then best answer would be 34. But most of them have said that 34 was not an option. So they have marked it as 32. Question number 57, minimum number of antenatal visits recommended by WHO. Here also, most of the people have said that 8 was not an option. Though 8 is not an option, it is not widely accepted now. Uh, so, the minimum number of antenatal visits, repeat question from August, FMG June, again, it should be 4 number of antenatal visits are recommended. Not 3, please remember guys. So, 3 is not minimum number of antenatal visits. You can go to WHO's website also. They still recommend it for they still recommend usually four antenatal visits out of which please remember the first is usually recommended for the registration guys the first is recommended for the registration okay purpose and then in every trimester we have one visit then question number 58 guys a male presented with features of dyspnea uh, uh, this I'm not sure uh, TAK is patient with GCS for Okay, okay, okay. I'll cover it in the next session, guys. I'll cover it in the next session. A male presented with features of dyspnea popcorn calcification was seen on chest x-ray. Likely diagnosis is. Now, no clear recourse for this, but at least uh, they have told me that popcorn calcification was mentioned, important, and a male patient was given. So, definitely a male patient uh, has uh, like high risk of pulmonary hematoma as compared to the breast cancer, breast tumors. So, fibroadenoma and important, chest x-ray was mentioned. If definitely we have discussed popcorn calcification on a chest x-ray is a feature of option D, panco, uh, sorry, op, sorry, option C, lung hematoma. Option D, uh, option C, lung hematoma, right? We have discussed pulmonary hematoma. Yeah, this was a one-liner, so easy. So, please remember option C, uh, pulmonary or lung hematoma. <laughs> in this, there would be popcorn calcification on chest x-ray. If they mention popcorn calcification on mammography, then your answer would have changed to fibroadenoma. Then your answer would have changed to fibroadenoma. Next, this was a clear image. Most of, uh, okay, fibroadenoma not given, great. Question number 59, a 17-year-old girl presents with primary amenorrhea and she experiences heaviness and pain in lower abdomen and the pelvis. Below given finding is seen on examination, likely diagnosis. So at least they have mentioned that there was a very clear image of a imperforate hymen. Okay, there was a bluish tinge on the hymen. Okay, so the answer to this question would be option A, imperforate hymen. We have discussed the same image. Okay, similar kind of image would have been there in the question also. So it was very easy question in perforate hymen. Repeat, yeah, repeat question again. Next question number 60. A patient, uh, thank you so much. It was septate uterus. I was thinking to add it, but I was not very much sure. Next. Uh, pick, they have told me that the pick was pretty clear. I am not sure then if the pick was not mentioned. It was imperforate uh, hymen. It was um, imperforate hymen. 
most of them are recalling that there was a clear image of vagina with the membrane on it. Septate hymen, septate hymen would definitely be just a septa would be there. But the patient would not present with primary amenorrhea body. Because uh, in primary amenorrhea there is uh, like hidden menses. The uh, menses are not started. In septate hymen at least the girl would bleed during the menses. Very good, very good. Shabash. A patient suffering from leprosy presents with the below given deformity which is the nerve injury responsible. So very easy. As we all know the most common nerve and uh, involvement in leprosy is the alnar nerve first thing. Second thing if we see the image also the person is trying to open the hand and when he is trying to open the hand these fingers are open normally but please remember the medial two digits the medial two digits that is the ring finger and the little finger they are not open properly. Okay, and this condition is known as a partial claw hand, right? This condition is known as a partial claw hand and we have discussed it multiple times. Partial claw hand is a feature of option B, ulnar nerve. In the last session also, the 100 images consisted of these three important findings, right? Partial claw hand, we discussed it is due to ulnar nerve injury, whereas complete claw hand is due to ulnar plus median nerve injury. That would be something like this. Okay, benediction hand, please remember guys, in benediction hand, this thing would be seen. A patient tries to close the fist but two fingers the two lateral fingers could not be uh, like uh, flexed okay and this is what is a benediction term deformity okay, ulnar plus medial was also given in the option then also ulnar would be the best answer to this question because it is a partial claw hand ulnar plus median would uh, definitely be a complete claw hand okay it would definitely i'll add it definitely okay ulnar plus median would be added uh, apart from axillary but uh, the answer would still remain ulnar now Next question number 61, a patient presents with plain abdomen, a plain abdominal x-ray reveals colon cutoff sign likely diagnosis. In um, chanting also we have done that uh, x-ray I had shown to you okay and I told you that due to inflammation uh, like near in that area mostly in the epigastrium there is inflammation and due to some inflammation <clears throat> the colon is seen to be cut off. Only two bubbles are seen on the either side and beach mein gaya bojata. So this is the colon cut off sign which is a feature of option B acute pancreatitis. Right? It is a feature of acute pancreatitis. Very good. All of you have marked it right. Very good guys. Very good. It is not acute cholecystitis, it is acute pancreatitis. Colon cut off sign and chronic pancreatitis usually on MRCP it shows a chain of lake appearance but it is chronic pancreatitis. Next, question number 62, a young adolescent girl presents with low grade fever, joint pain and an erythematous rash on the face. She gives history of recurrent infection, immunology workup reveals anti-Semith antibodies, likely diagnosis. So in this question, whether the history was not very much specific also, if the question does not match uh, pain abdomen radiating to back was given so to even it is more easier this was even more easier pain abdomen which is radiating to the back okay retroperitoneal pain oga sir very easy that uh, young adolescent girl i told you in the image also everywhere we have discussed this question now in the last medicine uh, session also we discussed young female presenting with infection like low grade fever joint pain or arthralgia okay joint involvement is there erythematous rash on face usually can be a malar rash or the butterfly rash and history of recurrent infection. If now with the other two, you will suspect SLE. But further, they have confirmed that the most specific antibodies are given, that is anti Smith. What else you need in the question to mark it as SLE? Systemic lupus erythematosus. Okay. Okay, so Malar Rash Toto, it was a piece of K for all of you. Next question number 63 guys, a patient has presented with herniation of the intestinal loop which passed along the spermatic cord and reaches till the, scrot till the scrotum or the cremastic muscle. So what would be answer? Very easy again discussion surgery chanting, Hania ke uh, like we discussed it on the one so in the single slide subcoach. Patient presented with herniation of the intestinal loop passed along the spermatic cord in notes also you can find this definitely Jaisar has mentioned it clearly very clearly 
वेरी गुड वेरी गुड ऑल ऑफ यू सो प्लीज रिमेम्बर इफ द हर्निया और लाइक द हर्नियटेड पार्ट इट पास फ्रॉम बोथ द रिंग्स दैट इज दीप एज वेल एज द सुपरफिशियल इंग्वाइनल रिंग वाया द इंग्वाइनल केनाल अलॉन्ग विद स्पर्मेटिक कॉर्ड प्लीज प्लीज रिमेम्बर राधर दैन आस्किंग वाया द इंग्वाइनल केनाल दे आस्ट अलॉन्ग विद द स्पर्मेटिक कॉर्ड सो स्पर्मेटिक कॉर्ड डिसेंट इन टू द टेस्टिस फ्रॉम द इंग्वाइनल केनाल सो दे हैव टू आस्क फ्रॉम द इंग्वाइनल केनाल विच हर्निया कम्स सो इट इज योर इन डायरेक्ट इंग्वाइनल हर्निया बिकॉज डायरेक्ट इंग्वाइनल हर्निया डायरेक्टली प्रोड्यूट आउट फ्रॉम द अबडोमिनल वॉल वेन इट बिकम्स वीक यूजली इन द एल्डरली पेशेंट फ्रॉम द हेजल बाग स्ट्रैंगल वे हैव डिस्कस दिस राइट फीमरल हर्निया यूजली एज सीन बिलो द प्यूबिक ट्यूबिकल लैटर एंड बिलो प्यूबिक ट्यूबिकल दिस वॉज द लैंडमार्क वी डिस्कस most common hernia another uh, type now another uh, versions they will find even more and more so question number 64 folic acid dosage for a woman with history of first child born with some neuro tube defect so this was the question they mentioned so this was very easy in psm chanting also in obg also in the last qrs session also i mentioned about this particularly that uh, we were mentioning we were talking about iron folic acid tablets and every time i mention about iron folic acid tablets when i say there is 60 mg of ferrous fumarate plus there is uh, four, four, sorry 500 micrograms of folic acid in it definitely i have always told you in cases of high risk pregnancies okay whenever there is a history of some neural tube defect in the previous pregnancy the folic acid uh, dose is 10 times and it becomes almost 4 mg so the answer to this question would be option b right very good question number 65 guys back in uk during plague outbreaks in 14th century ships and crews were kept in quarantine for how long so this is just a indirect way of asking that what is the incubation period or what is the quarantine period for plague because we know that uh, quarantine period is actually the maximum incubation period for a particular disease as in covid it was 14 days so in plague it should be please remember yeah i got to know about pressure source so it is option c 40 days okay it is option c 40 days next question number 66 uh, question number 66 absolute contraindication of copper tea is some uh, people mentioned that copper tea 380a was specifically mentioned some people said that image was also given sir so anyways the answer would remain same absolute contraindication of copper tea absolute contraindication of copper tea is so history of pid active vaginal bleeding due to undiagnosed etiology purulent vaginal discharge and distortion of uterine cavity due to congenital malformation please remember guys if there is a history of pid if they mentioned history of pid definitely that would not be a contraindication as such it can be a relative contraindication but not a absolute contraindication because if they are talking about history of pid the patient is not currently in the attack undiagnosed vaginal bleeding okay undiagnosed active vaginal bleeding rather is a absolute contraindication of inserting copper tea because you never know Okay, unexplained bleeding definitely it would be the answer because please remember in this case you never know if it is a carcinoma, it is a ectopic pregnancy. Okay, so vaginal bleeding is an absolute contraindication if it is undiagnosed. Okay, unexplained or un uh, undiagnosed bleeding usually it is the same thing. So in this answer, the absolute contraindication would definitely be undiagnosed or unexplained vaginal bleeding. History of ectopic pregnancy is also not a uh, absolute contraindication as such. Question number uh, because I have always told you ectopic uh, in during IUCD is in C two there is only five percent uh, cases in which ectopic pregnancy is seen. Okay, okay, got it. I'll change the option here uh, to history of ectopic. Okay, no issues, but the answer still remains same. Then question number sixty-seven, guys. A twenty-six-year-old female experiences lower abdominal pain and tenderness was present during palpation. Which STD kit shall be used under National AIDS Control Program? So NSEP kit. Which STD kit to be used? So definitely one question from STD kit is must every time. So this time also it came, but this time definitely they have not asked it directly. So I am not sure if vaginal discharge was mentioned. If vaginal discharge was mentioned, anyways the answer would remain same because green was definitely not 
as the not one of the options like ye bahut logon ne confirm kiya ki sir green to pakka option mein nahi tha so the answer to this question when a patient presents with lower abdominal pain as we have discussed it is more likely to be a pid pelvic inflammatory disease so the answer over here would be option d yellow kit red is used for a herpetic genital ulcer black is used for inguinal bubos okay please remember blue is for used for a non herpetic genital ulcer 68 a uh, 12 year old child on examination vaginal discharge was given okay though uh, it was given green was not an option so um, anyways you had to mark here for that question okay a 12 year old child presents with cola colored urine the mother gives history of sore throat two weeks ago what is the most likely diagnosis i don't think so like in patho everywhere we have discussed this multiple number of times now about nephritic syndrome so anyways it would be any issues so sarkari question again nephritic nephrotic nephrotic i got to know one more question was there i'll come up with that question again nephrotic ka diya hua tha mujhe pata chala so this was a nephritic syndrome question because cola colored urine is more likely to be a hematuria right so hematuria is a feature of nephritic syndrome so now uh, when with that they have given a very clear history that there is a history of sore throat two weeks ago so history of two uh, sore throat two weeks ago is more likely to be psgn as we discussed sore throat nahi tha it was boils on knee okay so okay sore throat nahi tha boils on knee tha to be it is better because boils on knee is also usually caused by streptococcus pyogenes so history of any of the infection two weeks ago is psgn two or three days ago would be ign nephropathy again a child from 5 to 15 was given so psgn would uh, likely be the answer because as we all, all have discussed in the last medicine session also most common cause of uh, nephritic syndrome in children would be psgn in adults it would be ign nephropathy right whereas fsgs and mcd minimal change disease both of these are types of nephrotic syndrome where fsgs is the most common cause of nephrotic in adults and mcd minimal change is the most common cause of uh, nephrotic in children cola color was the main clue yeah hematuria uh question number 69 an old man was experiencing excessive sexual desire this condition is known as i got to know uh, puri history di hui thi a uh, lot of psychiatric stuff was given earlier but uh, any thing the last line was this one i hope so ki uh, the person was experiencing excessive sexual desire and old man was uh, old was man was mentioned so beech mein kitni bhi history di ho that does not even matter right so this was direct question just asked in an indirect manner we have discussed this again in the last psychiatry qrs session we have discussed excessive sexual desire in males is known as option a satiria so so we have mentioned at least three important maine bole the to wahi teen uh, the usually satiriasis excessive sexual desire in males nymphomania excessive sexual desire in females whereas voyeurism it is uh, also known as peeping tom or scoptophilia achieving sexual gratification by looking at or watching private acts of others okay sadism is inflicting pain for achieving sexual gratification yeah, yeah i got to know ye bahut bada question tha kisi ko recall nahi ho raha but next uh, 70 question number 70 a male patient was brought to psychiatry opd where as he was hearing voices commenting on him as he believes his wife and daughter are planning to kill him likely diagnosis now i am not sure if auditory hallucinations was clearly mentioned in the question but people said that yes hallucinations were given in the question so a uh, patient male patient usually presenting with auditory hallucination and delusion and the most common delusion rather delusion of persecution that somebody is trying to harm me or kill me so a delusion of persecution along with auditory hallucination that means psychiatric uh, psychotic symptoms okay and uh, so all of these features are given so the likely diagnosis definitely becomes option b schizophrenia yeah the answer becomes schizophrenia question number 71 guys the question states a patient was brought with complaints of episodic headache sweating and palpitations now uh, it was a similar kind of history or not i'm not sure but definitely a case of pheochromocytoma came so you suspect pheochromocytoma which is the first line investigation in this condition persecution was given even more easier even more easier so division of persecution okay hyperactive male with hallus, uh, with hallucinations some people are mentioning hallucinations some people are not anyways the answer would remain most likely to be schizophrenia because in bipolar disorder delusion of persecution is less likely as compared to schizo right 
A patient was brought with complaints of episodic headache vagara. So you suspect pure chromocytoma first an investigation. I when I took the last medicine session, guys, in that I clearly mentioned when a table banata for your chromocytoma ka investigation of choice I mentioned. It is your plasma fractionated metal nephrins. Okay. But uh, I also at the same time mentioned that please remember screening test ki agar baat kari jai, it would be your 24 hour urinary metanephrine levels, catecholamine levels, or VMA levels, vanilyl mandelic acid levels. Okay, this was clearly mentioned. Okay, diagnosis karna tha, thoda hard tha, but it was easier because that triad was given episodic headache due to ep uh, episodic hypertension whenever catecholamines are released, sweating or diaphoresis. Okay and palpitation so it is option b 24 hour urinary metanephrine and catecholamine levels is the uh, likely first line investigation that we'd like to perform thank you so much amara was the fourth option now sahil okay okay great anand no worries the answer would remain same no worries okay no pheochromocytoma easy diagnosis but pheochromocytoma and bola the sarkari question of medicine sir Question number 72, a one year old child was brought with complaints of constipation even after using a lot of laxatives. Mother gives history that the child didn't pass stools in the first 80, 48 hours of life. What is the investigation of choice? A very easy question of GIT surgery, right? So I don't think so. Most of you would have made, made a mistake over here. One year infant there, uh, complaints of recurrent constipation. He has been using a lot of laxatives. Okay, thank you so much. Hypertension ki value bhi diyo iti to great. Okay. So, what are you suspecting? The provisional diagnosis in this condition. When a child does not pass meconium in the first 28, uh, for, sorry, first 24 to 48 hours, you most likely suspect that there is a ganglionosis, right? So, it is a congenital a ganglionosis. And congenital a ganglionosis is known as what? It is known as the Hirschsprung's disease. It is known as Hirschsprung's disease. So this is a it is a very characteristic case of Hirschsprung's given. Okay, a very characteristic. Okay, options are not right, but uh, whether su uh, suction biopsy was there in option, anybody? Just let me know if suction biopsy was uh, there in option. Plain CT was given. ठीक है. Suction biopsy was there in option. Only once a week, okay, once a week it is constipation again, so whether directly or indirectly, constipation of given, okay, pass tools once a week, okay? Usually they have recorded that it was an infant, so mujhe jitna mila hai, it was an infant they had given me. So was biopsy in the option, suction rectal biopsy, because please remember the investigation of choice for Hirschsprung's disease would remain suction rectal biopsy. If that would not be there in option, then we can go to any other option. Okay, suction rectal biopsy, if not given, then anorectal manometry would be your second choice. Okay, then the second choice would be anorectal manometry to just check the pressure. Okay. If biopsy given, biopsy would still remain the first choice guys. Please remember because you need to check for ganglionic cells. If ganglionic cells are checked on biopsy, that is the most definitive one. If not, then manometry could be the answer. Fiber diet, ultrasound, barium minima. In this anorectal manometry would be performed. Then you can also perform a barium minima guys. Please remember, barium minima is usually performed to assess the length of the segment of colon affected. Kitni, uh, whether it is a short segment or a long segment affected, okay? Depending on uh, that, your like uh, treatment uh, differs. Then a 12-week pregnant female presents to the OPD for antenatal checkup. Per abdomen reveals 14 weeks of gestation. Ultrasound image is given below. What is the likely diagnosis? No history required. Okay, <laughs> no history required. Now, whether it was investigation of choice or... Uh, Next step, mostly I got investigation of choice in this. X-ray abdomen was also given. Okay, got it, got it, got it. Then also the answer would remain same, guys. In this, it is very easy. Snowstorm appearance on ultrasound. This image is not right? Snowstorm appearance on ultrasound seen in the uterus. And the, uh, yeah, sarkari, sarkari, sarkari. Very good. It is option B, form mole. Complete or vesicular mole. I have taught you that deep like clusters are seen on grass appearance. Whereas ultrasound appearance gives you a snowstorm appearance, right? Ectopic pregnancy ka aur question tha. I will cover it in the next session. Ki, what is the criteria? So more than, we have discussed in QRS last session. More than 4 centimeter uh, size of the pregnancy. 
usually it, should, it is to be managed uh, surgically okay more than 5000 international unit of uh, beta cg levels or more than 3.5 to 4 centimeters of uh, size of the pregnancy next question number uh, 74 breastfeeding is contraindicated in which condition so this was a question i hope uh, answers here uh, the options here and there but the answer would remain same because uh, this is an absolute contraindication a uh, infant having galactosemia option c is an absolute contraindication for breastfeeding otherwise the child can suffer from flatulence diarrhea all of these features are seen right lactose intolerance and galactosemia these are the two conditions in which breastfeeding should be contraindicated Okay, whereas in hepatitis C infection, definitely we can start uh, in HIV also, in hepatitis C also, breastfeeding is seen to have more good effects in, in countries like India, okay, developing countries. So it is very easy for us, all of us. Next, uh, a patient was brought with headache, vomiting, weight loss over the last few months, uh, okay, and altered behavior from one day. This was a question discussed in last... Uh, session we had for uh, <coughs> medicine the same kind of question i discussed so people are usually people are usually talking about the same one yeah not an indication of surgery okay 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 i'll try to get back to you on that please uh, contact me in the uh, telegram group if you can uh, on the telegram the, you can just send me your recommendations for the questions also okay mm -hmm. so patient was having headache vomiting features of definitely meningitis okay on examination neck rigidity is uh, there so definitely uh, there would be meningitis we suspect some meningeal pathology right lumbar puncture was performed csf analysis shows elevated level of proteins low csf glucose and lymphocytosis so important one we have already seen that headache vomiting neck rigidity suggestive of meningitis options are why here to tension me lena weight loss over last few months definitely it is a chronic condition weight loss night sweats or evening rising fever maine bola tha ye tb ke cardinal symptoms hai yahi last session mein bola tha medicine ke it is the cardinal symptoms of tb to fever agar nahi bhi diya tha most of the people are saying fever was not in the option koi dikkat hi nahi hai na fever was not an option no issues with that yes some people are saying that uh, therapies were given ceftriaxone was one of the option i got to know that while i was coming so ceftriaxone was one of the options or koi in like uh, a cyclovir was one of the options for viral okay ATT was one of the options. So definitely in this condition, kya tha ek to altered behavior vagara to sab hai. It can be seen with any type of meningitis. But the CSF analysis was important that we made a table. Wahi is important tha. Elevated proteins are seen in all types of meningitis. First thing. Second, low CSF glucose rules out viral meningitis. Why? So please remember virus does not feed on glucose. So definitely there would be normal CSF glucose in cases of viral meningitis. We discussed this. Lymphocytosis. Lymphocytosis can be seen in cases of either viral or tubercular meningitis. We have already ruled out viral meningitis. So the answer to this question would be tubercular meningitis. Therefore, the answer would be more likely to be ATT anti tubercular therapy okay anti tubercular therapy with this i come to the end of this session guys i'll come up with the next one thank you so much for today's session and uh, yeah so like most of the things were covered in our session so i was happy to just see that like most of the things were covered so let's